Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Ask Five. My name is Monica Molinero, and I will be your host. And today I'm joined by Louis Pierre. Louis Pierre, do you mind introducing yourself to our audience today? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for having me. First of all, I, I'm uh, Louis Pierre Roger. I'm an occupational therapist and uh, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at uh, McGill University. Uh, I have two affiliations. So I'm with the Institute of Health Sciences Education. And I'm also with the School of Physical and Occupational Therapy. Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining me as well. I really appreciate it. I was also wondering if you would be willing to share what the question is for yes. this month's episode. Of course. So our question is, what does it mean to join a team or be a good collaborator? Very good and very important question. So thank you for introducing that. We're going to go and introduce our five and see what they had to say. Great. So today I'm joined by Suzanne Mack, Occupational Therapy Program at the School of Physical and Occupational Therapy and member of the Institute of Health Sciences Education at McGill University. Martin Pusick. I'm an associate professor of both pediatrics and emergency medicine at the Harvard Medical School. And I'm the director of the Research and Education Foundation at the American Board of Medical Specialties. Meredith Young. I'm an associate professor at the Institute for Health Sciences Education at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Tina Martimianakis from the University of Toronto. I'm professor in the Department of Pediatrics and um, director of medical education scholarship there. And I'm a scientist at the Wilson Center um, and associate director of um, the, the Wilson Center. And I oversee the portfolio that's about collaborations and partnerships. I'm Stuart Labarski. I'm a neurologist. I do general neurology at the Montreal General Hospital, and I'm also associated with the Institute of Health Sciences Education, where I'm a faculty member. What makes for a good collaborator? I think a good collaborator is someone who has a sense of their commitment, um, their time, the effort they want to put in, communicates that to the rest of the team and devotes that time or effort when they can. You know, so being explicit explicit at the get-go to say, this is how I can contribute, you know, let me know how I can do that. So spelling that out and someone who meets those commitments over time and is able to participate um, in those conversations. Sometimes a challenge of those collaborations is that you know, there's a sense of, depending on who you are and, and the nature of what you do, if you're a clinician, sometimes, you know, and I think even junior researchers, there's this sense of imposter syndrome, that you don't have the expertise or the knowledge, but there's a reason why you're there, because there is an experience, a lived experience, or a perspective that's important to the conversation. And so when I worked with clinicians before, I, I always reassure them that, you know, Yes, you may not be knowledgeable on the research methodology or the data collection, but the ways in which you could contribute is to help us identify, for example, the people that could be involved, right? Adjust the nuances of when we time the recruitment, um, the way in which we communicate to the audience that we're trying to recruit from, right? So they, there are, so it's, so yeah, I think there are, ways that different people can collaborate in, in a way that's meaningful. Um, helping to spell that out at the get-go is helpful. And then an awareness of that the, the co contribution from each individual will be different based on what they know and what their capacities are. And being really, you know, attuned to that. I think you also bring up a point that we once again take for granted and that it's not just based on your research expertise, right? To be a valued member of a team Absolutely. or to fairly contribute to the team. Like it's not just about the research piece in that. Absolutely. I mean, I think that also speaks to all the research that's being done, you know, when we think about integrated knowledge translation, you know, when the, when the person with lived experience is there from the beginning to help craft craft the research question, you know, and then like along the way help to collect the data and analyze the data. I mean, 
they're bringing this really important perspective that helps, I think, to ground the research and ensure that there's relevance and meaning, and it helps us then to really bring that research back into practice. So absolutely, I think there are so many different ways that people can contribute, and knowing that diversity of expertise and experience helps to make for a team that's very rich. The other thing that you brought up that was really interesting was you mentioned having these conversations at the beginning. Yes. Do you want to talk about that a little more? Yeah. So I, I'm really, um, I like to be as explicit as possible when I work with others as to what I can do and what I can't do. Um, and I encourage others to do the same. I think it just helps to make things very transparent and open. Um, and then there's none of this sort of, you know, um, going off at a tangent in the way you're thinking about something and say, oh, well, you know, they think that I, I, I can do this, but I can't. And, you know, there, it helps to minimize these sort of misperceptions, um, you know, of each, of each other. So having clear expectations from the beginning and really having an open dialogue means that then when problems arise, you can go back that, to that dialogue because you've done it before. And so you can talk it out and say, okay, well, you, we have this issue right now. This is what you can commit to or you can't commit to. So how do we help to foster that, right? And, and, and I think for the most part, you know, I like to believe that people do not have bad intentions, but there are so many different factors that influence how they can contribute. And sometimes those are things that are not within their control. If you're going to join a research team or you're going to join some sort of research collaboration or collaborate with someone, ultimately, like what makes for a fair collaboration? Like what would make, what would check the box for someone pulling their weight as a member of the team? When we think about fairness, I think fairness is a challenging concept because it, you know, it speaks to things like, like is this, are we expecting that all contributions are equal? I don't think so. I think there needs to be an understanding that the contributions won't be equal. They will be different. Um, to me, if someone ha has fulfilled the things we've talked about, you know, they have looked, they have reviewed the interview guides, you know, and given feedback before we've conducted the interviews. They've commented on the data that we've collected and helped to advance the data analysis. If they reviewed the paper that we agreed upon that they would review and give feedback, then to me they've met all their, requir their, their expectations. So that fairness comes in, I think, when those expectations have been met. And knowing that that's also going to evolve based on what happens over time. And it goes back again to the have the conversation at the beginning. Yes, absolutely. I think that's really important. You know, your first meeting should be, what is everybody, what is the goal? What is everybody doing? How is everybody going to contribute? Knowing that, you know, some people will have a bigger role, others will have smaller ones or provide different types of feedback. And at what, at what points during that research process will they be involved? Because that will also vary too. Definitely. I want to talk about these contributions to the team or what it means to contribute to a team. Mm -hmm. And in your perspective, when you're a part of a research team or you're part of a research collaboration, like what makes for a fair contribution or or what makes for someone pulling their weight? Right. So the um, I think that you look across the team and you see what um, what you're trying to accomplish, and so that uh, so a sense of mission, and um, and so that uh, so within a project and the like, and then within that within that project, then there are going to be um, a range of things that need to be done, and there are going to be a range of products for which people get credit, and um, and so that uh, so I think that. Um, that that a respectful discussion around each of these things, according to what each one can contribute, is um, is a key a key thing for um, the way a project can can move forward. But also so that so that within that, um, everybody's goals are addressed. 
they won't always be achieved and you won't always, you know, kind of, um, what's that Rolling Stone song? You get, um, you can't always get what you want, but you get what you need. That would be the ethos within, within, the, um, within the team. And so that there are always things that are more work than people want to put in, but the work has to be done. And so that it is hard work to code qualitative um, transcripts. It is hard work to transcribe an audio interview and, you know, the, that, that sort of drudgery that that um, hopefully the generative uh, AI will uh, will help us <laughs> with. But uh, the um, but uh, and so so I think that um, if you're the junior person on the team, then you know kind of uh, some of the roles are you know kind of more elbow grease in terms of the thing that you're going to end up doing. But in so doing, you dem- it's a it's an opportunity to show the commitment. It's an opportunity to show the passion. It's a, an opportunity to show you belong within the within the team in that the contribution isn't that you know how to do the the you know kind of um latest greatest statistical modeling technique but rather that um that you're able to clean the data to get it to the person whose bandwidth allows them to apply the latest greatest statistical modeling technique, but um, it's not a great use of their time to be doing the munging that, that gets the data through to, the, to, the, to that level. And so, um, so I think uh, a certain amount of um, humility on all parties um, and, uh, and willingness to engage with the work, and then, um, and then you know, kind of knowing that, uh, that you have contributed. And then at the end of it, that you will get recognized for that contribution. And um, and so that um, so the boldest way of describing that is who's going to be the first author, who's going to be the senior author, where are you going to be on, and, and the like, and um, and so there, you know, those those sorts of conversations. The I think uh, it's great when they can happen up front. But we talked earlier about the fact that up front is your first guess as to how the journey is going to go. And then the journey goes this way, that way, and the whole bit. And life events happen and people discover that they're not as passionate for the thing as, as possible. And so so part of the mentors, the team leaders uh, um, thing is to adjust, to adapt as it, as it goes along. And so that those, those co- levels of contribution and the levels of attribution and the levels of recognition may morph and change considerably between the start of the project and the end of the project. But, um, but in general, they can be handled with, um, with empathy, with respect, with um, a recognition that, um, that, that it is a team effort and, um, and, um, and you know, kind of brings it across. How does, how does one build a team? You find friends. <laughs> and then you find friends that think your idea is cool. And then you hang out with them. Um, no, honestly, there that so little science and scholarship in any space, but especially in health professional education, happens solo, right? Like we are very rarely blessed with an idea we come up entirely on our own and perfect while sitting on our couch talking to a pet and then publish into the world as a piece of brilliance. It's not how it works, right? Um, so the vast majority of what we do is done in a team. So often teams include people with content knowledge, so who understand kind of the context of where a study is happening. Often a team will include somebody who's had experience with a particular method, right, just that kind of more technical side of executing research. Um, Sometimes they'll include a team member who knows a lot about how to get things done. So if it's a practice-oriented project or a policy-oriented project, you'll want to have somebody who has experience with that. But how you build the team also reflects your personality. So I know some people who will cold call people to be on a team and say, hey, I read your paper. You're really cool. You want to work with me? I get super nervous about that. So I don't tend to build teams that way just because I've not very good at cold calling people, mm-hmm. I guess. Um, so I honestly tend to build teams with people that I like how they think and I like working with them. So people who, when their name is in my calendar, I get excited or like, ooh, this is going to be a good chat. Um, and then you, as you get to know people in the community, you kind of build a list. It's always hard to build your first team, but that's, I guess, where a mentor or a supervisor can help you or someone who's connected into the community, can think through people who might be a good fit for your project. But the best way to get anything done 
is to build a team of people you like to work with because they help you keep, stay accountable. They help you stay excited about the project. You can talk through the bumpy parts with them. Um, and it's more fun. Okay. So going off of that piece then, finding friends, finding colleagues, finding a network. Mm -hmm. If you're someone who's in the position that I'm in currently, where up until this point, colleagues and collaborators have been people essentially that have been my supervisors or mm -hmm. my mentors. I'm just starting out in my career and this period of time is supposed to be used for finding that network and finding that team and finding that people that I vibe well with to do research. Where do I start? I'm smiling because the one thing to – and I'm smiling because probably it took me a while too – is to realize that your ideas are interesting to people beyond those who had a direct responsibility for you, right? Because sometimes we're like, oh, well, this this worked at this time in this place because they were my supervisor and they had to get me through, right? So realizing that your interests and your ideas – are important and interesting to other people is like stage one, right? So people beyond those who are directly responsible for me might think this is cool. Um, often it's hard for people who identify more as introverts because it's harder to walk up and talk to people and say, hi, I'm Monica. Want to hang out um, and be research friends? <laughs> because <laughs> all adult friendships are awkward. Uh, research friendships are no different, right? And, and it takes just putting yourself out in the world. So conference presentations, if you see somebody whose work you think is really cool or close to yours, hang out in the hall after and have a chat with them. I have longstanding relationships where I asked a question or found somebody in the hallway afterwards and said, I have no idea. I don't have a question, but I just thought what you said was cool. And it took us a while to find something to work on, but I just liked how the person thought. So I told them that. And then we hung out a little bit. Again, people have different levels of comfort, and sometimes our bad habits come from external pressures, right? Like we're in a funding environment where <clears throat> some of our funding has like 8 and 10% success rate. So you're trying to stack the deck. Oh, it's so cool. So novel. So amazing. Most amazing team. And look, it's the team is stacked with like Nobel Prize winning, Karolinska Prize winning, phenomenal, hundreds of publications people. And that's sometimes seen as playing the game. I've had mixed success with having people like that on projects because sometimes they are amazing and they have multiple publications because they're fantastic mentors and really lean into team environments. And others are just not so good, much. Not so much. <laughs> it's sometimes you just try, right? And then you imagine that, you know, contribution will be reflected in the author line at the end. So if your name's on it, you still got to meet ICJME criteria for authorship, which means you have to contribute in the following ways. Otherwise, you're not on the line. That's a, the game that's hard to play. Or you, authors are ordered in terms of contribution. So if you haven't really contributed, you're going to be not in the place that people tend to want to be on the author line. But that's a hard way to learn that. <laughs> a sort of sneaky way of Seeing if people have a long trajectory of these kinds of behaviors is like poke around on their authorship profile or their website, right? If every paper has a fundamentally different team and there aren't repeat collaborators, that might be a like science spider sense, right? That they're either super well networked and mentor and support hundreds of people or they kind of are on a team and don't act as a repeat collaborator, which could be maybe they've burned that relationship or maybe that team wasn't tackling something in a programmatic way, right? There's multiple ways that could explain that pattern. But if a person has a pattern of not having a, a group of collaborators that they work with repeatedly, sometimes that can signal these kinds of parachute project relationships. So that's the only kind of external evidence I can think of but between – or in addition to asking people if they've worked with that person before, what was it like. Um, but again, that's dependent on having a network. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is if you're trying to build a team and you have one or two connections into a field, you can also ask for people to connect – for those one or two people to connect you to other people. Like, hey, I've read this person's work. I know you know them. Any chance you could connect the two of us over in email for a conversation? 
And then you're not – it's not a cold call in the same way. It's like a lukewarm call because <laughs> it's coming through a calm and shared relationship. So that's another way to do it as well. <laughs> well, then, okay, with that, then let's talk about what underlies a good collaborator. Like what does it mean to be a good collaborator? How would one demonstrate that they're a good collaborator? You show up, you participate, and you contribute. What does contribute mean? It can mean a bunch of different things. And sometimes contributing is dependent on what's asked of you. And sometimes the clearer that can be, the easier it is to make sure you meet it, right? If someone's like, I just need you to look for the thread across projects because I know that that's your strength. Can you do that for me? Absolutely. You lose the thread in project three, <laughs> right? Like I've shown up, I've done what's asked, and I'm contributing in the way that I can. Sometimes tasks and teams are a bit more emergent than that. So what it means to contribute can be different, but show up. Give your attention. Do what you're asked to do or say will do. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people start up com collaborations early on in their career based on their friendships, right? Or convenience, who they have around them. Um, but that could also be dangerous because you might not see eye to eye in terms of what the the goal for the research should be. So you, then you're stuck with a team of friends who are, you know, they get together and they have, they have a drink, a bite to eat, whatever, you know, they go out dancing, what have you. And they're they're talking research, but they're not really getting the project done, right? So I think that's also very important to be deliberate about who you surround yourself, um, depending on who, what the problem that you're dealing with uh, at the moment is. And, um, and think about those collaborations in terms of the perspective, as you said, that they bring. Um, to the issue and why you want to engage with that conversation. Um, is something that's interesting to you that might push your thinking might not be the right kind of perspective to bring along on a project uh, that has a set goal because it's set up in a particular paradigm. So those are the kinds of things that you trip over early on in your career. And then knowing that that's what the problem is and then saying maybe this project is not going anywhere or maybe I need to change collaborations and having those hard conversations. It's kind of hard, you know, to say to, to someone that, you know, it's not working out. Um, uh, the person on the grant is not the person you end up writing with in the end because along the way you've had to develop other uh, um, relationships to get the project done. What does it look like to be not as great yeah. of a collaborator? Um, not paying attention to deadlines, uh, delaying people, coming at the end of the t uh, at the end of the process and saying, you know, this is. I'm gonna say <laughs> the word I use is okay. I'm not gonna say it, <laughs> but now I want you to. Like, you can't just like <laughs> if they come to you and say, oh, this is just complete crap and bullshit. We can't publish this. I won't put my name to it. And this is like you were almost finishing. Like where where were you? Like you know, six months ago, a year ago, where were you at the beginning of the project to tell us that this is not going in the right direction? And you know, those conversations are hard to receive at the end of a collaboration, right? So towards the end of a collaboration, you're thinking that you're tying things together and all of a sudden somebody comes and just derails everything. Um, those, are, those are not good collaborators. They should be engaged um, throughout. Now, time is an issue in our field. Uh, most of us are doing more than one job. Um, at the outset, I, I gave you my affiliations. There are more that I didn't share, and each affiliation comes with responsibilities. So just like me, everyone I work with right now has has a million different hats that they wear, and there, our schedules aren't always in alignment. So you need you need to, to prompt people. You need to, um, so the PI and the senior need to be on top of things, right? So a good collaborator who wants to be a good PI and a good senior also don't, doesn't take on 20 projects at a time. Because if you are, then you're not doing the, the job of the senior person. Because you're supposed to be bringing the project along and doing that career mentorship for the person who's, um, who might be uh, less advanced than you. So that's also very important. Um, and then if you have a collaborator role, you know you can sort of trust in the process that somebody else is taking care of that. And also don't come and derail it afterwards, right? So sort of know your place a little bit and you get you get to appreciate that uh, as you develop the relationships. I like having conversations at the outset. What do you expect when you're a collaborator? What do you expect when you're working with a PI and a senior on a, on a project? 
Um, and sometimes we make adjustments depending on, you know, other people's expectations. And then there are other things that come into play like um, promotion and, um, you know, do you need this publication? Uh, you really need this publication and you want to play a more substantive role than when you started because you really need it for career advancement. Um, you should be able and comfortable to bring that to the team. And if that's the case, to have that sort of conversation and see if um, there's room for you to take a, a more um, senior role on the project. So I think uh, that's why relationships matter. That's why uh, spending time developing those relationships matter because you have to have hard conversations along the way. Um, people have a lot of different talents that they can help that they can help out with. Um, you know, getting involved in research teams can be doing literature searches. It can be um, uh, contributing as being an interviewer or a research assistant. It can be if you have some knowledge of statistics, for example, then you can help with the statistics on the project. Um, you can do some writing. Um, there, there's various ways to get involved in research and, you know, as you say, dip, dip your toes in the waters and getting a sense of what it's like without having to take on a full research project all on your own, which of course would be daunting and wouldn't, wouldn't be expected right off the bat. Um, and then that's fair. Uh, that, that's fair. And it could be something quite small. Um, but, a, but, you know, in many instances, these perhaps small contributions are so, are valuable enough that the project would not have proceeded forward without it. Um, so th there, there is not a set amount or time of work that needs to be done, you know, that, that would be considered fair. It's really based on what you've established uh, beforehand with, the, with, your, uh, with your supervisor and that you've met those expectations. Right. So we keep coming back to this theme of open communication at the get-go. Like, that Absolutely. is the underlying and, theme. And, you know, people will listen to this and go, well, that seems very straightforward. But I can assure you it is not so straightforward to many people. They come in feeling like it's going to, like it's a very kind of passive relationship. Um, as, you, as you said earlier, top, you know, the to with a top-down structure. Um, but the best functioning research teams don't actually have that structure. There's there's often a you know there is a, a bit of a hierarchy, but that doesn't mean that good communication, two way communication. Um, you know, you as 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 someone who is starting out doesn't have um, the the. Uh, the right to, to set your own expectations and limits. Not only do you have the right, it's that is actually expected of you. Yeah. And within that as well, you kind of touch back on like that piece of the fair contribution. If you're upfront at the beginning about yeah. the time, capacity, skills, ability, then you kind of already set the boundaries of what a fair contribution looks like in this case. Absolutely. Go, goes back to what we said earlier. There's no such thing as a set fair contribution. It's just based on what you what you discuss up front, almost like a contract. Mm -hmm. It does sound like that. Yeah. So, Louis Pierre, what did you think about what everybody had to say? Uh, I thought a lot of things, I'm going to say. Um, First of all, I think the question was very important, uh, and it's something that we rarely talk about in graduate studies. Let's start with what do you think wasn't said? Okay. Um, I think collaboration is not only for the co-authors. Like It was very about that when we heard the five persons talking. Um, but... Being a good collaborator is also very important for the PI, for the first author, for the, the person that is, let's say, the responsible of the study, uh, and also for the senior person that is masterminding what is everything that is going on. Um, I feel that the leaders of a project also need to have good collaboration skills. I think in my position as a postdoc, since I'm st I'm an early career researcher, uh, and if I can say it like that, um, I I often am managing my own projects and managing my teams. So I'm learning to be a collaborator in other people's project because I get to know a little more people and I, I learn to embrace that role. Um, but I feel like 
it's part of the success of a project is can you lead but also collaborate? Um, and I, I think that I think it was if, if it was said, I didn't really hear it uh, in what was said by the five persons. And maybe uh, if I can ask, like, yeah. did you see things that were not said? Oh, and, uh, hmm. I would agree with the points that you made. Um, I also think that when we think about joining a team or being a collaborator, it's it's something that we take for granted a little bit in that now that I'm in my first role or in my first faculty position, to think about constructing a team or putting a team together mm -hmm. of new people or people that I'm interested in collaborating with was a brand new experience. So mm. I think for me, what I would want to highlight that was touched upon, but maybe we could delve a little bit deeper into, is the fact that sometimes you do just need to send a cold email or sometimes you need to ask someone you know if they know someone who does this thing. Or sometimes it does mean you're spending some time Googling some people oh, yeah. here and there, right? Mm -hmm. to see if there's people that have that expertise that maybe you're lacking in in some way. And mm -hmm. putting together and joining a team sometimes can seem a little bit, I think, intimidating when you're mm -hmm. just starting out. I get it. But I feel like the research community is, I, and I, could, I, I can speak for the health research community because it's the, the one I know most. Mm -hmm. People are so open and nice, I feel. Um, and like, the worst they're going to do is they're going to say, well, thank you, but no thank you. Like, But I've never received either. I, I had this same stress when I was contacting people. And every, everyone is always so nice <laughs> and so open about our ideas. And like the worst I've received so far is, well, well thank you, but I don't have time. Like, But I would, I would love to collaborate, but I don't have funding or I don't have the time. But good job and like thank you for addressing that like it, it's mostly what we receive when we're inviting people to collaborate and like i think it's something that is important to to say uh, like f especially for i think the people that are gonna watch that podcast is uh cold call people initiate collaborations because like the the worst that's gonna happen is a, is a very small no a, a kind no like but or you can make some very good friends or colleagues. Like, So I'm happy that the experience was positive. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad too. And I agree with you. That's all I was thinking as you were saying these things was the worst answer that you're going to get is a no. So it feels almost silly in retrospect that it gets built up as this very intimidating thing. But simultaneously, I think I'll still be intimidated whenever I cold email mm -hmm. someone for the first time just to see how it goes and go from there. But once again, yeah, mm -hmm. the worst that they can say is no. Cool. <laughs> Well, with that, Louis-Pierre, I wanted to thank you so much for joining me today. Your insights were so helpful and so relevant to what a lot of young researchers are experiencing for the first time. Thank you very much for having me. It was very fun and uh, and good job for, for that podcast. I think it's very relevant. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you so much. Hopefully it'll continue to be helpful yeah. and relevant moving forward, right? Definitely. So Great. for everyone else that's watching and listening, thank you so much for tuning in and we'll hope you'll join us again to Ask Live. Okay, warm up question. Complete. Boom. On the floor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, right? This is effortful. <laughs> For me. It's effortful. I don't know where to stop. You keep nodding, so I just keep talking. I lost the thread of the question. Can you ask again? Yeah. <laughs> Before I go off on what I think the question was. Yeah. Okay. Little, okay. I'm doing good. I'm not doing much of the talking, so I'm just... I'm, I'm feeling a little rambly. Hmm? But now I had a great case the other day where, there, where a kid had put a bead up his nose as part of a magic trick to make the bead disappear, and he succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> then we're moving to the bonus questions. All right. So this is the fun bonus. part. <laughs> the wind down, the fun part. The fun part. How have I failed? <laughs> <laughs> fun. I know. I Definitely. I'm not probing any further. I just, <laughs> I thought that was great. I always just give a little bit of pause. No, it's answers. all good, Monica. Did a light just go out or something? Or, wait, okay. Never mind. Don't worry about it. My eyes were like doing something weird there. You ready to try the yes. first take? Yes, I'm very excited. Awesome. Okay, well, I'm glad. Um, which camera? 